<laughs> Good afternoon. My name is John Herbst. I run the Eurasia Center here at the Atlanta Council. I'd like to thank you all for coming today. We've got a terrific program for you. Uh, we have literally uh, the world's best minds when it comes to the issues of Siloviki and um, kleptocrats in Russia. Uh, I don't think I'll waste your time by reading the biographies of the speakers, but Dr. Zan Zaslan, who really knows more about transition economies, especially transition from the Soviet system or the socialist system to a, to a real economy, uh, one of the world's experts will present briefly a, a paper that he's done on the subject. Uh, we'll then have comments fr from our panel. Uh, Dr. Brian Taylor, who's written extensively about uh, political governance in Russia and Putin's Russia. He has a, a new book out this year on the code of Putinism. We'll, we'll talk about the Soloviki. Um, Dr. Louise Shelley at George Mason, who is and one of the world's foremost experts on corruption, especially corruption in Russia. We'll talk about that problem. Uh, we're graced today also by Elizaveta Asitinskaya, um, a first-rate Russian business and more journalist. And we will ha hear from them on this subject. With, uh, Andrews, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, this is what I would like to introduce to you to, uh, today. Uh, uh, is to brief how the United States can combat <laughs> Russia's kleptocracy. And it should be up on the web right, uh, right now. So if not now, it should be there any, any minute. So <clears throat> what is it about? What I would like to uh, tell you here is essentially four different things. First, briefly on the nature of uh, Putin's regime. Second, how Russian money goes abroad. Uh, offer a brief uh, assessment of the size and destination. And then finally, I have six uh, policy recommendations what I think that the US government uh, uh, sh should do about it. The fundamental uh, thing today is that you understand uh, the nature of Putin's, uh, Vladimir Putin's uh, regime. And I think that it's best characterized as a fusion uh, between organized crime and secret police. And I would characterize uh, Putin's regime as uh, three circles. The first circle is the state, it's the power, it is uh, uh, b the secret police, the police and the courts that are all controlled from the Kremlin. This is what Putin took control over during his first term. The second uh, circle which essentially took control over during his second term, that, was, uh, that is uh, the big state corporations. Uh, Gazprom, Rosneft, uh, Rostec, the big, uh, big state banks. Then we have a third circle, which came up, uh, became known first in 2004, uh, uh, that is uh, Putin's uh, private old business friends from St. Petersburg. The cronies, Gennady Timchenko, the brothers Arkady and Boris Rothenberg, and uh, Yuri Kavalchuk. Yuri Kavalchuk has taken over all the financial assets of uh, Gazprom and also the television uh, channels. I think it's 20 television channels today that are controlled by Yuri Kavalchuk. So it's uh, privatized rather than controlled by the, by the state. Uh, Rothenberg and Timchenko have primarily made their money on building pipelines in privileged deals for Gazprom. Uh, <coughs> and these three circles cannot fully function without a fourth uh, circle, which is the, uh, the uh, offshore. So what happens is that nobody in Russia today can really uh, hold money safely to a, uh, to, uh, to a considerable extent because there's really no property right or rule of law in Russia. As a consequence, if you have a lot of money, you had better keep it somewhere safe. And what is safe? 
Well, it's somewhere abroad. Where can you keep it abroad? Well, not in so many places, because if uh, uh, money is of dubious origin, it needs to be anonymous, and also there needs to be sufficient uh, financial depth. This is uh, sufficiently large in the financial markets that accepts anonymous money. And that's not so uh, many places. Uh, but the ironic thing is that also the Putin elite keep the money abroad, because if they would lose power, God forbid, then they would also lose the money. So therefore, they want to have a reassurance abroad. Uh, so how does money flow out from Russia? First, it goes to Cyprus because of an old uh, uh, Soviet uh, double taxation agreement. In Cyprus it gets, typically if it's uh, really dirty money, a number of uh, shell companies. Then it typically goes to the British Virgin Islands for a few other new uh, shell companies. Then on to uh, Cayman Islands and after that uh, to essentially two countries, the United States or the United Kingdom. The main uh, entry into the United States is through um, <coughs> Wilmington, Delaware, which is the biggest uh, <coughs> money laundering site in the world. And the other is uh, to Britain. So in uh, 2015, the United States uh, Treasury assessed that $300 billion a year was uh, laundered in the United States. This is an uh, official US Treasury report. And recently in Britain, uh, the National Crime Agency assessed that $125 billion is laundered into the, the United Kingdom. This is far more than anywhere else. By comparison, uh, the IMF after the financial uh, crisis in uh, Cyprus in 2013 made a forensic study and they found only $14 billion of uh, foreign direct investment from Russia in Cyprus. Cyprus is simply too small. And then you can imagine how small all these uh, uh, Caribbean uh, islands are, with one exception, the Cayman Islands, which uh, happens to have uh, 500 uh, uh, banks. <coughs> and this money ends up in empty buildings in Belgravia and London, in New York, in, in My uh, uh, Miami. So this should be seen as hoarding, as safe uh, keeping of uh, money, not only from Russia, also from China and Venezuela, you have it, but much of it comes uh, from Russia. So then we come to the question, how much money goes out from, uh, uh, from Russia? Uh, Russia has had a steady uh, capital outflow of normally uh, 30, 40 billion dollars a year since 91. And if you just add up the official statistics, this is about 800 billion dollars. There was a, a prominent uh, working paper by the Na National uh, Bureau of Economic Research uh, uh, last year that uh, went through various assessments and found that probably this is the amount of Russian uh, private money abroad. And uh, at that time that was two-thirds of Russia's uh, uh, GDP. And, um, uh, then you wonder how is this money being created? Of course we have uh, uh, decent private enterprises, uh, that, that's uh, one part, but we also have uh, embezzlement from the private, uh, from the, uh, private and public uh, sector. Uh, the best study we have of this originally was from uh, the opposition analyst uh, Boris Nemtsov, who was murdered outside of the Kremlin uh, three years ago. And, um, and uh, uh, Vladimir Milov, they made an assessment that Putin's four close friends, the Rothenbergs, uh, Kavadchuk and Timchenko, for the years of 2004 to 2007, 
made $60 billion from uh, taking uh, it out from Gazprom alone. And this business has continued. Uh, I already mentioned uh, how they are making the money through public procurement of a big project and through asset, asset stripping, I should add, uh, uh, stock uh, manipulation. Uh, we have all reasons to believe that uh, Vladimir Putin is also part of uh, these, uh, these uh, uh, deals. And this is not all uh, that uh, Putin and his friends are uh, making. A uh, reasonable assessment is that the total gains is uh, in the order of 15 to 25 billion dollars a year from 2006. I say 2006 is that they hadn't got everything in order first. It's, uh, we can see that it's around that period when the big money spinning uh, companies are uh, coming under <coughs> their, their control. So we have various uh, uh, pieces of evidence how the money is uh, uh, distributed and a fair uh, guess or rather uh, deduction from these pieces of evidence is that Putin gets uh, close to half of each of these pieces. If that were true and we count from 2006 then Putin's fortune held abroad would amount to 100 to 160 billion dollars. And this is money taken out of a country. It's not held I in Russia. I can go into more details of this, but um, this is uh, uh, pretty much uh, uh, the, the uh, situation. And uh, what you do then with the money? You take it abroad, as I've already uh, uh, described, and it is uh, uh, taken primarily to these two, uh, two countries. But with the Magnitsky Act, some of the money should be frozen. With uh, uh, Katza, and uh, in particular through the sanctions of Putin's cronies from March 2014, much of this money should be frozen. In fact, it is not. There have been three minor incidences of uh, frozen money only because the money is not known. The big problem here is that the US has a massive production of, uh, of anonymous uh, uh, companies, in particular in Delaware, but also Nevada, South Dakota, um, uh, 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 Wyoming. So, what should be done about this? The first thing that should be done is that the intelligence community should give, be given a firm mandate to investigate what do we know, how much uh, uh, dangerous or uh, uh, illegal money is there in the, the country. The second thing is that the US Congress should adopt legislation uh, prohibiting the formation of new anonymous companies in the United States and that the existing anonymous companies should be required to provide the names of their beneficiary owners within a certain period of, of time. I should say that uh, the European Union has already done this through a, a directive from uh, uh, the fourth anti-money laundering directive of May 2015 and uh, that process is now uh, underway. This is the reason why there is so much more of uh, uh, anonymous companies in uh, uh, the US and the UK. It's also connected with uh, Anglo-American uh, leg legislation. And at present there are several draft laws, uh, draft bills about this in the Congress. And I do hope that this uh, goes through. That's the most important uh, measure. A third measure that should be undertaken is to uh, do something about um, uh, the real ex uh, estate. In the Patriot Act of uh, 2001, there are stri strict rules against money laundering. But after half a year, an exemption was made for real estate. 
This is a temporary uh, exemption that has been steadily prolonged. So if uh, uh, this is done away with, the Patriot Act can clean up real estate as it's so well cleaned up the, the global uh, <coughs> b banking uh, system. This can be done with a stroke uh, of the pen of, uh, by the Secretary of Treasury. The fourth measure is that uh, uh, money should no longer be allowed to go through law firms without uh, financial control, which uh, is the case today uh, under the attorney-client privilege that law firms have. This came out uh, in the case of a looting of uh, uh, the uh, Malaysian Sovereign Wealth uh, Fund, 1MBD. And then a fifth thing that needs to be done, it is that uh, FinCEN, uh, the uh, US Financial Investigation uh, uh, Authority, should be given far more resources. Uh, at present, 350 people work there, which is nothing for this massive uh, task. It should, this number should be multiplied so that FinCEN can really investigate what is going on. And then finally, uh, many countries do not allow big cash, uh, cash payments. The US still does. Uh, there should be a limit to cash payments, for example, of uh, $10,000. Thank you. And just thank you. That was a superb overview of the problem of ill-gotten gains and what's happened to it. Brian, I was wondering if you could comment on how this meshes with the role of the Siloviki in Putin's style of governance. Sure. So, for those of you who haven't heard the word before, Siloviki, it we have seats up in the front and on the side for folks who are standing in the back. It, it basically means people of force, people of power. It comes from the expression in Russian for the force structures or the power structures. So this would include military, security, law enforcement, policing bodies. Uh, and this is one of those words that's maybe not quite as prominent in the English language as vodka or perestroika, but it sort of made it into the standard discourse. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna use that word. And it was now more than 15 years ago when a Russian sociologist, Olga Kristanovskaya, wrote an article called Putin's Militocracy. Uh, which sort of brought out this idea that he was bringing in a lot of people from former KGB, former military, former interior ministry into government. And I think it was more than a decade ago now, the economist had a piece on what they called Putin's neo-KGB state. So this notion has gotten a lot of prominence in the West, that there's a sort of group of the Soloviki from the various power structures who are dominating Russian politics. And if you look at opinion polls of Russians, if you ask who does Putin most represent, the first answer is often the Soloviki. So Russians themselves sort of see this phenomenon uh, taking place. Without calling into question the importance of these group of actors, I want to complicate the story uh, in two different ways. First of all, it's a mistake, I think, to see the Soloviki as one coherent team or group or thing. It's actually a, a series of competing groups, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. And I think the second mistake is to see this as some kind of well-ordered uh, rational police state. I see it not as an orderly police state, but a disorderly police state in which these groups are often at war with each other. So let me say more about both of those points. First of all, uh, this notion that the Sloviki are not one team. You can think about this in two different ways. One is in terms of bureaucratic structures, the formal institutions that exist. And the second is in terms of informal groupings or what in Russia they, all, they often call clans. So the bureaucratic one is fairly simple to understand, right? Groups, bureaucracies that have overlapping missions are often competing for resources, for power, uh, for influence those sorts of things. So when you've got multiple law enforcement structures or multiple security structures, they're supposed to work together, but oftentimes they're competing with each other for influence, right? We know this from other countries as well. We know this was true in the Soviet period when there were basically three main power ministries, the Ministry of Defense, the KGB, and the Ministry of Internal Affairs. So after the Soviet Union collapses, those are broken up into multiple structures, around 14 under Boris Yeltsin. 
because he wanted to fragment the power of the KGB, for example. So these groups start competing with each other, these bureaucracies. Uh, and under Putin, they were consolidated somewhat. Some of them were uh, brought back together, but there's still around 10 that really kind of fight for power and influence. And this happens both in the foreign policy realm and in the domestic policy realm. So the one foreign policy example that will probably resonate the most with the audience in Washington is the fact that there were two groups of hackers from the Federal Security Service and from the GRU, military intelligence, that both were inside the DNC server, right? Uh, and it appears that the FSB got there earlier and got there better, so they weren't found for a while. But the GRU kind of screwed things up, and we've seen the Mueller indictment, and it was uncovered that both of these groups were in there. And there's an even later story, uh, and you can read all about it in an article that Elisaveta's The Bell published. And uh, if you haven't read this article yet, you should look it up on your phone while I'm talking, because it's actually more important than what I'm going to say. But <laughs> the, the, the gist of it was uh, that several top cyber people in the FSB were arrested and charged with treason. And there's some reason to believe, although we don't know for sure, that they may have leaked what the GRU was doing to people in the West, actors in the West, because they were competing with this other structure, right? Um, so we see that in foreign policy. We also see it in domestic policy all the time. So they compete over who has the right to bring criminal cases, because the right to bring a criminal case means you can make money off of opening or closing a criminal case, right? Uh, they fight over who has the right to do surveillance, because if you can do surveillance, that gets compromising information on people called compromat, which can both be monetized and can be used for influence, right? So these structures, although they sometimes work together, they're also competing in different realms, okay? And they're even sometimes competing within one agency. So there was a story within the last year about the FSB in which a, a source inside the FSB said, well, the third floor of Lubyanka, the FSB building, is fighting with the second floor, and the fourth floor is fighting with the first floor, and the fifth floor is fighting all of them, okay? So this is not just one sort of unified machine. Now, the Klan part is a bit more complicated, but briefly, in, in Russian politics, mm -hmm. the most important question is not really where does someone work, but whose person is this, right? Who does this person belong to? Uh, and so one of the reasons these fights were taking place inside the FSB is because powerful clans outside the FSB are trying to put their people into different parts of the alphabet soup of sub-agencies in the FSB. So Sechin, the head of Rosneft, is trying to put his people there. And Chemizov, who's the head of Rostec, which is the <coughs> arms builder, is trying to put his people there. So there's this ongoing clan battle for influence within these organizations. That leads to the more general point that Putin's Russia is not always an orderly police state. It's often a disordered police state. Now, obviously, if an order comes down from the Kremlin to the investigative committee or the FSB that we need dirt on this person or we need you to lean on this person, that can be done, right? Those orders are not ignored. But there's lots of time in the day besides following the orders from the top at which these groups compete uh, for power and influence and, uh, of course, uh, money. So if we look back over the last <coughs> 18 years of Putin, we see a whole series of what they call Soloviki Wars breaking out. Sometimes they're about money, sometimes they're about politics, often they're about both uh, in the intersection of those. But that's a sort of constant refrain. Even within the last year, uh, the FSB arrested several important people in the investigative committee because they were taking bribes from people in organized crime groups. Uh, and when one of the guys who was arrested, I think he was a colonel, uh, was justifying his behavior, he said, it wasn't a bribe. It was a gratitude for the decision I had made about the disposition of a criminal case, <laughs> right? And the disposition of the criminal case meant the person <laughs> got out for free, right? Uh, but so this is sort of constantly going on. And in every one of these stories, there are sort of two issues. One is the corruption itself. Uh, but the second issue is, to whose benefit is this corruption now being made public and are people now being arrested? Uh, so that's sort of a constant feature of the system. And I, I will say in closing that there are, I think, in my experience, real professionals in these organizations trying to do their job in a serious manner. Uh, but the number who believe their mission is to so-called serve and protect, 
right? Uh, it sounds like something a dog does, but it's a good thing, right? When the law enforcement <laughs> structures want to serve and protect, uh, they're kind of overwhelmed by the people who see their job as not to serve and protect, protect, but to squeeze and to rob. And th that's not my joke. That's a joke of Bunny Sakunin, who's a very famous Russian uh, crime no, fiction writer, actually. Uh, so just again, to conclude, two things I want you to take away from this. The Sloviki is not one group or one team, and the state is often disordered, not well-ordered. Thank you. Um, Louise, to give you a chance now to talk about how corruption works in Russia. Well, there's not one way that corruption works. <laughs> and I want to invite you to a, run a research center called TRAC. And tomorrow we're having a talk on corruption in Russia at noon with Yulia Krylova, who's in the audience. So you can learn more about how <laughs> it functions. But let me say something more about one of the greatest forms of corruption that Anders in this latest report spends two words on and mentions that I believe deserves more attention. His last report had more attention to this, which is the issue of corporate rating. And in corporate rating, you have one set, one business being basically swallowed up by another business. Using the justice system or abuse of the justice system, violence, intimidation, and other forms of coercion. <coughs> How does this fit with this discussion we've had now of Siloviki and kleptocrats? Is that the only way that you can use the courts and you can use violence with impunity is to be part of this power structure. And last week, um, Anders released another report on misuse of the justice system in the US. And one of the cases, this case of Poimanov, was a man who a owned a granite company. And the attorney general's son also was in the granite business. And because he wanted to get rid of his competitor, or he wanted to acquire his competitor without <laughs> buying it, he engaged in corporate raiding, being supported by his father, who was the attorney general, who could then use corruption, use coercion, and not prosecute anybody. So this is how the, the, the problem of corruption and abuse of power works to have a very strong impact on the Russian economy. Because it doesn't mean that the biggest businesses win. It's the biggest shark eats the next shark down. And whoever is closer to the structures of power can get away with this. And it also helps explain part of why so much of Russian capital is leaving Russia. Because you never know when you lose favor and someone else can use their connections to raid your business. So you need time and you need a life's worth of resources outside of Russia to be able to survive if you have to. This has enormous consequences, not only political consequences, capital flight consequences, but consequences for the economic future of Russia. Because most of this money that we're talking about that's been fleeing, if you listen to this, in this presentation, you're hearing about oil money, you're hearing about gas money, you're hearing about resources related to natural resources, right? It's not related to production, it's not related to high technology. In fact, about eight years ago, I published a book on human trafficking, in which I said that human trafficking follows patterns that are common to the rest of the economy. And I explained that human trafficking from Russia worked like a natural resource model in which you salt off the women, and then they were moved by other criminal groups. And you sell them off like raw material and do not receive the maximum profit from this. And unfortunately, this is a lot of what we're seeing in Russia is this capital that's leaving, the billions, is related to natural resources. And it is not being invested in the tech future of Russia. The Chinese are investing heavily in technology. The US is, Europe is, 
but Russia is not, is not doing this. And, and that is going to have an enormous negative consequences for Russia in the future. But while Anders has talked about the money that is going into real estate, and that's a very severe problem, but we also have money that has been laundered from Russia and transferred here that is going into our technology community. You need to think about this um, lovely criminal character, Usmanov, who was a very major investor in Facebook. And therefore, it is not only money that is being moved into intangible assets, but the most, I mean, into tangible assets like real estate, but the most intangible parts of our economy that are the fastest growing. But they're not going into the Russian economy to help promote technology, which is why we have so many of these tech specialists who are outside of legitimate employment. And how does the Russian security services and others find them to do their hacking? Sometimes these tech specialists are engaged in selling botnets, malware. They're then fingered by the West that asks for their extradition. They are locked up and given an offer that you can't refuse, which is a get out of jail card if you go work for the state. And so we have many of the, of the top Russian organized crime criminals linked to the state apparatus. And that's a result of an absence of capital to employ them in legitimate ways. I can think of a few very interesting cases that you may not be aware of that I've written about in a forthcoming book, one called Pharma Leaks, where the person behind this um, online business of selling Viagra online en masse wound up in prison and got out of prison by becoming the head of the Russian payment system. Um, a very key position. You have Mr. Vinnick, who was arrested, who ran a Bitcoin exchange through which $4 billion of Bitcoin was processed. And we happen to know that the 12 people who were charged recently were all paid and did their activities through Bitcoin. So to understand this relationship between the corrupt, the criminal, and the state is, is very important. They are not separate relationships. And this is you know, basically what I want you to think about, is how the, you, you start off with a problem like corporate rating, which undermines entrepreneurship. And then you wind up with many other significant consequences, because there's no way that you have the ability to maintain and secure capital and build a healthy business unless you have all kinds of protection. And so most of this money that, that Anders has been talking about is, is the natural resources of the Russian state. And once it was, you know, it can be timber. In the past it was furs. And now in the 20, 21st century it is oil, it is gas, it's timber, it's precious metals. But it's not what makes a great technological state for the rest of the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. That was wonderful. Uh, Elisaveta, you have a very unique perch. You report on business in the United States and Russia from California, so you're not very familiar with Silicon Valley. Uh, Louise started the conversation on the impact of corruption on the Russian economy. If you could elaborate on that, and also on the point that she made regarding Russian money flowing into Silicon Valley. Well, let me first start with, uh, uh, with the perspective uh, of Russian business, how Russian Please. business exists in, in this discovered reality and environment. So uh, uh, the business is a body that uh, always should find uh, a solution by nature, by definition. So business is like a river that should overcome uh, stones and uh, problems and falling trees and still uh, to be vivid and uh, go further. But uh, also business uh, is in the position of this person uh, who just heard uh, uh, the offer 
he or she can't refuse. So what business should do in this situation? Of course, business first in first hand uh, looks for alliances that could help to overcome the problem. For example, to find some p powerful people that at least could defend from another powerful and uh, another people, another Siloviki and another people from force ministries. And uh, that, ma that uh, made possible a lot of uh, different alliances, like let's say one of the most uh, uh, clear uh, and prosperous <laughs> companies uh, in Russia, tech giant Yandex, uh, should uh, get Sberbank, state-owned bank, as a golden uh, shareholder to protect property rights and to get uh, legitimate defense for, for the company and for its development. So uh, that means lobbying. Sometimes it means uh, shady deals, not in the case of Yandex, of course, because it's a public company. So sometimes it means uh, shady deals with some people in power who become uh, shareholders of the companies uh, through the various schemes. And here we uh, necessarily face into the question of property rights, rights because those property rights are not defended by anything. And here people in power should register their assets for drivers, house cleaners, mothers, sisters, brothers, and uh, uh, relatives to let them to legitimize this property rights and to get their stakes in the business. And what we observe uh, now that more and more uh, companies uh, various scale uh, are seeking for these alliances. For example, uh, a huge company, uh, Mail.ru, is now seeking alliance with Rostec, company uh, that is run by uh, Sergei Chemizov. So, uh, no, uh, so here I'm not uh, only talking about small entrepreneurs, uh, but also about a huge and successful companies. So. Uh, in my view, isolationism uh, doesn't help. Doesn't help here, because it makes more powerful peop powerful people more powerful and uh, less powerful, even less powerful in this situation. When I'm talking about small and medium-sized business, uh, we observed a couple of uh, of really heavy examples like. Uh, Dodo Pizza, this is just a famous brand in Moscow, or um, uh, uh, Anderson Cafe, who faced really weird accusations from, uh, from people in power, and they couldn't protect themselves, and they were involved in uh, massive scandals and stories about, uh, let's say, fake uh, drugs or fake uh, formed cases where they should protect themselves. So another uh, trend that I uh, observed uh, in recent years that people in power try to transfer the, <coughs> uh, their uh, power into assets through using their kids and families, uh, so-called uh, the, uh, crea creating this new nobility. And uh, we can uh, detect that many people with very familiar, familiar last names uh, uh, their kids uh, became like a CEOs and the founders of uh, important companies. So we can uh, say that those are uh, kids of Patrushev, Zolotov, Ragozin, Ivanov, Fratkov, and many, many, many others. So their kids take places in important companies and run those companies. So. Uh, and uh, the final point I uh, wanted to make that uh, overall uh, regarding uh, uh, Russian business that exported capital uh, abroad because of uh, poor investment climates in Russia and poor property rights. That's all true, but uh, uh, we currently observe uh, the revise of this social contract between business uh, and the power. If previously business was uh, able to make money within the country and spend money and invest money outside the country, that now the tendency is that business uh, forced uh, also to stay with its money within the country because they have examples of uh, sanctioned business people like Vixilberg, uh, Deripaska, and others uh, who 
tried to distribute their money abroad, but were pu let's so-called punished for doing so. And uh, in fact, uh, their capitals were not protected. So business is now is in ambiguous situation when they need to store their money in Russia, but feel also very uncomfortable with this lack of property rights and, and increasing pressure from uh, people from power. Thank you. That last point you made is really interesting, and so I'd like to follow up on it. Uh, of course, sanctions on Russia as a result of its war in Ukraine and also the interference in our elections has been growing. The April list put out by our Treasury Department had a major, major impact, it seems. Uh, are there, do you have any data or telling anecdotes regarding the, the new dilemma you just described? Well, <laughs> I have a lot of on anecdotes. <laughs> well, we'll about an in the absence of data, we'll about take about uh, first of all, the first anecdote is that uh, this uh, list. Some people, uh, uh, some people make jokes uh, about Forbes list that was uh, put, uh, yes. you know, and the sanctions the, just uh, the Russian champagne list. Yeah, and just <laughs> cut, cut, uh, cut and paste from recent. Right. Uh, list of the most expensive, uh, most most uh, rich people made by Forbes. So it's hard to say uh, uh, how much money people, uh, you know, uh, had to withdraw from the economy because it's still microeconomics versus macroeconomics. Because we have four case case of four. And uh, for sure, one of them is going to argue with this decision, uh, maybe in court, and uh, maybe to legitimize uh, uh, his investments. But uh, we definitely see the tremendous consequences of these sanctions for specific businesses and particular businessmen. For example, at one day, uh, the largest aluminium company in the world, L Rusal, lost half of its value uh, on the stock market. So uh, it jump, jumped back and maybe it, it, it will overplay uh, the situation and withdraw some, some sanctions might be withdrawn uh, and, um, uh, and waived. Uh, but definitely this is significant for for specific businesses. Okay. Uh, the we've seen in, in Russia. We we, know that we have an excellent discussion of the corruption problem. Uh, we've seen some a little bit of political turmoil. I don't want to over exaggerate, but we've seen some political turmoil in connection with pension reform. So that I offer this to anyone on the panel. Is the problem of corruption understood among the Russian people, and does that condition their reaction to issues like reduced pension benefits? Yeah, I think that uh, w what we are seeing now is that there are massive protests, and they've been going on since the 15th of uh, the June. Now, during the weekend, there were protests in at least 140 cities around Russia. So these are very substantial uh -huh. uh, protests. And uh, you mentioned here, Elisa, the uh, social contract that it's broken for the businessmen, it's broken for the people also. In the last four years, Russian uh, disposable real income have fallen by 17%. They're increasing this year. And uh, uh, Russia's GDP has barely increased since 2009 by an average of 1% a year. So this is stagnation, and people wonder, what are they getting? The original Putin deal was, you stay out of politics and I give you increased standard of living. And that was a substantial increase in standard of living for nine years. And then it has stopped. And what comes now? Two big decisions uh, coming through on the 15th of June, increasing retirement uh, age, for women from 55 to 63 over a long period, and for men 
from uh, 60 to 65. You say these are low ages, that's uh, not, uh, uh, not all that uh, cumbersome, all uh, uh, East European countries in the European Union have already done this, uh, or even more. But the point is that it's a redistribution of wealth. Mm -hmm. So it's the poor uh, who are paying for it, while the uh, wealthy are not paying at all. Strangely, at the same time, they increased the uh, value added tax by uh, two percentage points, which is in money terms more important than the increase in retirement age. But it's the increase in retirement age that people <coughs> protest against. Uh, uh, an added aspect here is that uh, the Communist Party today is functioning as a trade union for pensioners. Okay. So this is what they really care about. And by and large, the uh, Communist Party is uh, a subsidiary party to uh, the United Russia that rarely votes against. But these are three subsidiary parties all voted against the pension uh, reform in the, in the Duma. And my slight suspicion is that Putin will turn around and say, we don't really need this. Because he has made one clear <coughs> statement about the pension reform. He says that none of the alternatives I've been shown has really been what I liked. So he has uh, op left the possibility for him to withdraw open. And as uh, always when it's something unpopular, then Putin asks Prime Minister Medvedev to present it. So we'll see in the next few days if Putin will withdraw or amend the, uh, the proposal. Last time he saw this kind of social protest was in January 2005 when it was also the pensioners who were out uh, uh, protesting. And the reason then was so-called monetization of social benefit. In fact, a cutting of uh, various benefits. And Putin, is, in his wisdom, at the same time increased uh, the salaries for the highest uh, state officials four times. And somehow that combination didn't uh, go down that well. I think we are seeing something similar now. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, yeah, I wanted to add uh, on that. I have quite radical for the most Russians' uh, opinion about that. So I think uh, pension reform is the first time when a uh, majority of Russians faced the brutal reality of their life. Because normally people, most, most people uh, in Russia, they live in a different reality when you live in the United States uh, regarding taxes. Russian people believe that they pay only 13% of income tax, and that's it. And they have flat income tax, and they're very happy about that. This is a very tricky thing, because uh, the entrepreneurs and entities and uh, companies pay social tax for them. That is 30%. But people don't pay out of their pocket. That's why they believe their government is so good. I believe, for example, if everyone starts paying from their, out of their pocket this 30%, the next day, next couple of weeks, <laughs> Russia will be different. <laughs> so the pension reform is the first time when people face the br brutality of, uh, of real economic life uh, here. And uh, that's why they're sh so shocked with that. Uh, because they, they, they found that unfair. <laughs> but in fact, life was unfair for them, but for minority of them, so-called entrepreneurs. Uh, regarding Putin turning back, let us make a public bet. <laughs> I so never make bets. No, <laughs> sorry, because I don't think he'll turn around. Maybe he make it a little bit softer yeah. in some way, but they just don't have another solution. They don't have another, s another solution. They need to find this pension money for pay to pay people. I should add that. Uh, I think it was in 2005 that Putin said that uh, I, I will not <coughs> increase the retirement age as long as I'm a president. Yeah, yeah, we all watched this. Yeah. yeah, but well, life has changed. <laughs> Indeed. Okay. Uh, just one more, one more point on, on this subject. One of Putin's achievements, going back to his early days, was establishing uh, fiscal restraint. 
And he has been a, a consistent deficit hawk, um, unlike politicians in other countries, <laughs> including our own. But uh, when you say that he could not find this money elsewhere, well, other politicians in other countries have found that money elsewhere in terms <laughs> of debt. Is this something that he might consider vis-a-vis -vis pension reform? So he, he doesn't have to do reform because he's willing to extend to borrow more. Or is this prohibited by, or made harder by sanctions? Well, it's hard to, uh, to be inside the Putin mind. Yes, uh, we understand. Uh, <laughs> but but I, I, I think uh, he was convinced by uh, a very liberal economist, not socialist, uh, right. but liberal in, in Russian way. That means uh, conservative in American. <laughs> <laughs> classical. <laughs> yeah, classical, classical uh, e economist. That uh, and also his experience uh, of 1998, that debt right. and state debt is, is in principle uh, a bad, dangerous thing, and it makes uh, you know uh, it possibly may break the the country apart, and he doesn't want to to country be falling apart. So, yeah, just to, to agree, uh, Russian public debt today is. 13% of GDP, so it's virtually nothing. 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 And uh, international currency reserves are $450 billion, about one third of GDP. So Russia is very well insured, but it's what you said, John. Uh, Putin sees this as a matter of sovereignty, and the sanctions make him uh, an even more fiscal conservative than he would otherwise mm -hmm. be. Okay, there are two more themes I'd like to explore before we open this up to the audience. Um, Brian, we, we've really focused more on the economic and the corruption issues than on the political side. But in your judgment, uh, do the Siloviki in any way play into the questions relating to pension reform and the instability that may come from various types of measures like that? My sense is that the various sort of high up people who we consider Soloviki are not asked their opinion about pension reform, right? I, 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 even, I, I, when, <laughs> even when political instability results or may result? Even then, right? So I don't think Putin goes to Nikolai Patrushov or <laughs> Viktor Zolotov. So this is the head of the Security Council, the head of the National Guard, certainly not the Minister of Defense or the head of the KGB or the FSB, excuse me, and asked, so what do you think about this pension reform? I, I don't think that is how decision making works at the, at the top in Putin's Russia. Now, they're asked about how, we, how do we manage protests, right? And they have a pretty good repertoire for managing protests and keeping them within comfortable limits for the regime. And a couple of years ago, Putin made another step to concentrate the police forces that deal with sort of day-to-day -day protest policing within one agency that's in the control of his former bodyguard from St. Petersburg. So he, they're clearly thinking about problems of protest. But in terms of decision making, I don't think they do sort of simulations where they say, okay, let's think about all the possible consequences of pension reform. Oh, one of them might be protests, so let's bring those people into the room to talk about it. I don't think they do that kind of decision making. I think it's much more compartmentalized. And you don't see, this is another question, you don't see different factions within the Siloviki using turmoil as a way to better position themselves vis-a-vis -vis rivals? I have not looked for that, so therefore I have not seen okay. it. Um, but it would, honest answer. it would not surprise me if, you know, the increasing number of protests is used as an argument by this or that actor for resources, but I have not seen that. Okay, Louise, you want to jump in? No, I, I wanted to say that when we think about these Soloviki and the kleptocrats, they are both, the Soloviki are both officials and they're businessmen mm -hmm. because most of them own businesses. Mm -hmm. They may not own it in their own name, but they own it in their wives' name, their children's names, not just for inheritance, but because they are capitalizing on their positions. And as Elizabeth has said, the, the Russian economy hasn't been growing. And remember, Russia has 
a serious demographic problem that we have not mentioned today. And so one of the ways to solve a labor force issue is not having people retire. Because if you don't have enough people to work, then you want them, it's not just an economic issue, you want people to sort of work until they die. And they're not living that healthily with the level of medical care, so you may not even have to pay them pensions if they <laughs> you know, work until they're 65, because they may not be alive after that. The other problem, which we, we need to talk a little bit about, which is, you know, I am a social scientist, and Paul Massaro here had a had a hearing on opioids and, and, and drugs at the Helsinki Commission, is that Russia, like us, has a very significant drug problem. Remember that the drugs are leaving from Afghanistan north through Central Asia and transiting Russia along the Trans-Siberian Railroad, and Russia has millions of addicted people, many of them young, many of them part of the should be part of the workforce. But unlike alcohol, which has been a traditional Russian problem, there's now a very significant drug problem without drug treatment facilities. So what do you do with this, this squeeze at both ends? That you're not, having, you're not having births, you're not having people living that long, and you've got many people who can't into, enter into the labor force. It's similar to the US in that we can't find enough people sometimes for the jobs that exist. And so I think there may be other reasons that you're forcing people to work longer to have employees for the workforce, not just budgetary issues. And, and that's something that we've got to put into this, this equation. And to think of all these people that we're talking about, Soloviki and kleptocrats, as business people who have to keep their enterprises going to keep generating money in some way. Okay, I have one more question I put out to the whole panel. Uh, corruption as a Russian foreign policy tool to exert influence both in the near abroad and in the far abroad. Any comments? <laughs> Anders? Yeah, uh, w what we see is that uh, uh, Russia's uh, foreign financing has changed very substantially. So uh, Putin is clearly in favor of giving money to people rather than to countries, specific individuals. And if we take one of the most obvious legal examples, it's Gerhard Schröder, mm -hmm. the former German uh, chancellor, uh, working for, um, uh, <coughs> for Nord Stream, and uh, also a former Prime Minister of uh, uh, Finland uh, works, uh, Pavel Lipponen works for, for Gazprom. And one of the top Swedish businessmen works for Gazprom. These are completely legal uh, agreements. Then when Putin was Prime Minister, uh, 2008 to 2012, he traveled around to the Balkans, had meetings with one top politician after the other, one on one discussing South Stream and there were expenditures on behalf of Gazprom but we don't know who was paid and this is uh, a dangerous thing. The other activity we are seeing that is these people like uh, uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin, Putin's uh, chef who has financed uh, the war in Syria and now in Central African Republic three journal, uh, Russian journalists who were there to study these uh, Russian mercenaries were murdered today, mm -hmm. unknown by whom. And uh, uh, Prigozhin is, uh, has been active in, uh, in East Ukraine also, and of course he uh, was uh, the man behind the Internet uh, uh, Research Agency, better known as the Troll Factory in St. Petersburg, that uh, did all the activity on the social pl uh, platforms in the US. And this is a private actor, obviously he gets money uh, from uh, Russia. We have another example in Konstantin Malefeyev, also sanctioned by the, the US for his uh, uh, providing uh, a private mercenary army in uh, eastern uh, Ukraine. So we are seeing that uh, there are uh, pr private Russian businessmen who are either being forced to 
or induced to provide uh, services uh, abroad. And then we are see uh, seeing uh, individuals who are being uh, uh, corrupted. <coughs> And therefore, transparency is so important so that we can really see all these activities. Louise? I would compliment what Anders is saying. Not, not I mean, praying the compliment in C O M P L E M E N K. I mean, I, 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 I am that, but also the other. In that, I think there's also an effort in what I would call corruption of institutions as well. Institutions of our legal system, which Anders, that's where I will compliment Anders oh, on his <laughs> legal, on his piece last week on interference in the American judicial process. There was a piece um, yesterday in the Atlantic on uh, corruption and influence on our asylum process and how we're how the Russians are misusing red notices in our country to target dissidents, they use it to target business people. But it's also, I think, the issue that we talk about of the NRA. And that paying money and influencing the legal process through the NRA when it should be declaring its receipt of foreign funds, which it didn't do, is a corruption of a major uh, non-governmental organization in the United States. And what is interesting is that it's in this area that we also see the merger of the criminal and the corrupt. Because the key actor in this NRA story is a Mr. Torsion. But as we know from Spain, that the Spanish organized crime prosecutor was doing tapes of Mr. Torsion's conversations, which on a previous visit here about in June or end of May, he talked about handing over his tapes on torsion to, to Mueller. So if we have this corruption of our institutions, it is also corruption by people who are also believed to be involved in organized crime activity. It is a dual activity, not just <laughs> corruption, plain and simple, of paying bribes. I don't think you mentioned that he's also deputy governor of a Russian central bank. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's very good, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else want to comment, Brian? Or OK, open the audience. OK, Elaine, first, then second, and third. Uh, Elaine Sereo, Associate Rector of UACU in Kiev, Ukraine. Thank you very much. This has been an incredibly enlightening presentation. Uh, my question has to do with something that I uh, don't quite understand how it's going to impact, but it seems significant. Uh, China and Russia have recently reduced or pulled out 50%, I believe, approximately, of their bond of of bond money here in the US. I'm not quite, if I've got it quite right, but it was something like 41 billion or something, an incredible sum uh, by Russia. And how does that play out with removing that, those funds from our, bond, uh, from our system? Thank you. I think uh, with regard to Russia, I think it's quite easy that uh, it's simply, uh, this happened just before uh, the summit in Helsinki. Right. And uh, clearly the Russians saw that this will lead to a big risk for aggravated uh, US sanctions. One part of the uh, sanctions discussion uh, yes, in the R R Ruby Van Hollen deter bill is uh, uh, sanctions on uh, 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 Russian uh, central bank reserves and uh, this would be part of that. So the, the Russian central bank simply wants to reduce the risk of being sanctioned by, uh, by the, the, the US and uh, similarly Russia withdrew its holdings, it was in the order of 100 billion dollars 
from the New York Federal Reserve in connection with the annex, uh, Russia's annexation of, of Crimea. So, so you can uh, keep the money in different ways. Most of the time, most people keep uh, most money in, uh, in uh, US dollars if it's big money. But if you have sea sanction risk, obviously you try to do something else. With regard to ch China, that has been more gradual that we are not buying uh, uh, U.S. Uh, treasuries. I would presume that this is uh, also an attempt to, uh, to safeguard themselves uh, from undue U uh, U.S. Uh, uh, pressure, but it's not at all as uh, fast and radical in the case of China. Okay. Uh, just a short remark. The, the, the money were uh, withdrawn in April and May. The report of Central Bank on bonds comes two months after actual actions were taken. I see. Okay. So that's that's mm -hmm. five yeah. because I just <laughs> went to my newsletter and read yeah. official statistics. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, but it, it was definitely part of the plan how to oh, be protected huh? from sanctions for the sanctions. So that that's that's official mm -hmm. position of the of the state. Okay, question over here. Thanks so much for the great panel. And Dr. Shelley, thank you for the shout out earlier. I'm Paul Massaro uh, with the U.S. Helsinki Commission where I cover anti-corruption. Uh, and recently I've been doing a lot of work on corruption in international sports. So I've got kind of sports on the brain. Um, in the Sochi Olympics in Russia, uh, or post-Sochi Olympics rather, Putin's approval ratings went up by like, you know, some absurd amount, like 54 to 83 percent, something like that. Uh, talk about Soloviki Wars Mutko, who was Minister of Sport at the time, was promoted to Deputy uh, Prime Minister based off his successful doping program uh, that he ran <laughs> at the time. Um, so I was, my question is, you know, with the recent World Cup having just concluded in Russia, have we seen any similar effects? That is to say, the consolidation of power mixed with sort of a jubilation, you know, Russia is this great host and, you know, kind of like ba integrated back into the world community you know, let's say. Sure, I can respond briefly to that. So Putin's bump in popularity after Sochi really had very little to do with Sochi. It had to do with Crimea, which happened at the very end of the Sochi Olympics. So that's why his popularity rating went up so much then. Uh, I, I think there was pretty much universal agreement that Russians hosting of the World Cup was a success. And it generated a lot of positive feeling domestically in Russia. but. It's been swamped actually by this pension issue. So Putin's approval rating has gone down. United Russia's mm. approval rating has gone down. So the lasting political effect of hosting this mega sports event so far seems to be nothing. Because, I mean, they timed the announcement about the pension reform so it took place the very first day of the World Cup, right? Um, so they were trying to blunt the impact, but it didn't seem to succeed in blunting the impact. The unfortunate conclusion, Paul, is that it's more popular with uh, war than with sports. <laughs> <laughs> Dan, Lieberman, thanks for an interesting panel. Please identify uh, yourself. Pardon me? Please identify yourself. Oh, Dan Lieberman. Uh, yes, this is for Anders. Yeah, there is something I really don't understand. Uh, Putin uh, supposedly has uh, $130 billion overseas and is growing. I think he's around 63 years old. He'll be 70 by the time his presidency is over. He may stay on to be prime minister. But uh, with the age of 70 and $130 billion overseas, I doubt if he needs more than $1 billion for the rest of his life. If he took that money and invested in, in Russia, he would certainly boost his uh, parents and uh, leave more of uh, credibility uh, so what would be the reason for him to have this huge sum of what seems to be useless money overseas? Good question, and the answer is not uh, obvious, but I think it's uh, several parts of it. This money is in order to be the most powerful person. Money is power, power is money. Uh, if he has less money than others, then he's not the most uh, powerful. You can see in other uh, countries around, in uh, uh, Belarus, in uh, Azerbaijan, in Kazakhstan, in Turkmenistan, uh, the president is always the, the richest man. If it's not the richest, then he's uh, uh, n n not, r not really uh, serious. Then uh, you can see that uh, you can be uh, challenged. 
if something happens, then the money can help you take back, uh, uh, take back power. You can pay off various people. It's also that the whole kleptocratic system means that people are expected to make money. Putin has uh, given three of his cousins about uh, half a billion dollars that uh, we know partly through the Panama Papers, partly through Russian, Russian Forbes. So this ma information is out and um, it's a question of giving uh, many people money and having many people uh, money. So, uh, Russian Forbes, for example, uh, published four childhood friends of Putin who are holding at least half a billion dollars. Uh, and uh, why are they holding this money? So that P Putin can rely upon them. So he has his close friend, uh, these uh, four big uh, businessmen that I mentioned. Uh, then he has uh, his childhood friends, the four, at least four of them. Then he has at least uh, 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 five relatives, uh, close relatives, uh, that are holding at least half a billion dollars each uh, before him. So th this is a system of lots of people have money so that they can assist if necessary. It's also an, quite an extraordinary belief uh, in money as uh, uh, power. So this is uh, uh, not only a kleptocratic uh, system but also a plutocratic, obviously. If you are a personal uh, authoritarian leader you can never retire. Putin will die on his, uh, his post uh, unless he has some relatives that he can promote as uh, Lisa mentioned here that uh, uh, they are now promoting all kinds of uh, uh, ch children uh, to, uh, to very senior posts at a young age. So what uh, is happening now in Russia is a recreation of the uh, Russian aristocracy as it existed before 1914. Mm -hmm. Okay, question over here. And then <laughs> I just wanted to say that I, Frank, I personally oh, don't believe in 100 million, zillion, uh, billions. Sorry for saying maybe please things please. you don't want to hear, but I frankly don't believe. I think this is a myth. Do you have a number that you think is real? Uh, I don't think, uh, look, I'm a business journalist. Uh, I was responsible for publications at Forbes. I want to respond only for factual information. Fair enough. Okay. <laughs> I don't have fa factual information that would prove any dollar. Okay, that's good. Well, Ral Dugan has uh, Ral Dugan. It's only one man. And what? Okay. Means there are plenty of men who have said same man. Don't tell me about Ral Dugan. I lost my job because of Ral Dugan. <laughs> <laughs> I have a, I have a right to say ab ab about this. Well, thanks so much for this. Great. Thank you so much for this fascinating panel, um, the Kathy Cosman. Um, I have one question relating, well, which sort of bridges several gaps, namely the bridge to Crimea, okay. the fact that it's so expensive, of course, being built by Rotenburg, Rotenberg, I guess, um, and the fact that because of that, there are no roads being built, or there's no money for roads to be built in Russia. Uh, and connected to that, there has been on and off a truck driver strike um, because of the taxes that they are being charged absurdly, grotesquely to drive on these non-built or semi-built or whatever one should call these roads. So I was wondering if you have an update on the status and the impact of the truck driver strike. Thank you. Uh, Andrews? Yeah, as far as, uh, let's see, it started 15th of November 2016, and then it has been going on and off, uh, and uh, with this uh, long haul track. Uh, so the, uh, they just want to introduce a toll uh, per uh, kilometer uh, uh, toll, and uh, these are the private truck uh, drivers who uh, find that this would be too expensive and the number given is that Igor Rothenberg, the son of Arkady Rothenberg, uh, should get 150 million dollars a year on this and they, they have first they delayed the introduction because of a protest 
then they reduced it, uh, and then they have, uh, were discussing to increase it. Uh, but uh, I think that the, the protests have by and large uh, fizzled out. With regard to the bridge uh, over the Strait of Kerch, um, first it, the idea was that Timchenko should build it, but he refused, and it seems that he has aggravated his relationship with Putin because he refused because here Timchenko had lived by the Geneva lake and then he had to move to Moscow, poor thing. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> and uh, so he could no longer live in uh, Switzerland because uh, of um, being sanctioned. And uh, strangely, Putin complained no less than five times in public that uh, his uh, dear friends Rothenberg's uh, uh, Kovalchuk and Timchenko had been uh, sanctioned by the, uh, the US uh, and he considered that this was against uh, human rights. Uh, one of the few times I've heard Putin speaking <laughs> about human <laughs> rights. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, so uh, clearly this was uh, a good deal that uh, Rothenberg uh, got. Uh, so it was three and a half billion dollars uh, for the bridge itself and uh, I think five billion dollars for uh, adjacent roads that w were needed uh, for uh, for it, and uh, this is a typical business. And uh, m my guess in these uh, uh, no bid um, contracts that half of it is uh, excessive uh, uh, profits. That what we can see from the pipelines uh, that have been built from uh, uh, for Gazprom that they are uh, so much more. Uh, more uh, expensive. Uh, politically, it's quite important that this is uh, uh, blocking off the Azov Sea. And now, in the last three months, we have seen at least uh, um, more than 150 uh, ships going to the Ukrainian ports, there, primarily Mariupol, that have been detained. So, this uh, seems to be a gradual Russian approach to detain the ships so that. Uh, uh, people don't really want to um, ship to uh, Mariupol and in this way turning the Azov Sea into a, a, a domestic uh, sea. So obviously this has a, a, a big defense <coughs> potential because if you look up on the map uh, the Azov Sea is a very big um, uh, sea and uh, almost half of the remaining uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, sea coast is uh, to the Azov Sea. Okay, other questions? Right here, and then here. Hi, Jamie Lumley from the Stern Group. Uh, you mentioned towards the end uh, about the effect of corruption on international finance from Russia. I was wondering if you could expand upon uh, the effect of kleptocracy and the Siloviki on Russia's foreign policy. So on the Stern Group, we work with Ukrainian trade, and we just saw how yesterday there was the um, trade agreement which was ruled upon by the WTO about uh, the embargo on uh, rails and trains and other uh, train cars going from Ukraine to Russia which has been banned since 2015 and um, obviously for some things like this it seems like it would tread on the toes of some of uh, the business magnets in Russia um, and I was wondering if sometimes if Putin even though there's kind of this close-knit circle with other business colleagues um, if he does put his politics first in terms of the move with Ukraine um, and then just how that kind of resonates in the political landscape with the kleptocracy and those close businessmen. Cool. <laughs> yeah, I, I could answer on the WTO thing. The US has um, uh, uh, imposed steel tariffs and aluminum tariffs with national security arguments which are of course completely flawed, since these are against, mainly against NATO countries. Uh, whenever you uh, call for national security in the WTO, you win. So n nobody uh, goes against it. And this is, so, so Russia did just exactly the same as the US uh, does all the time. So uh, with that argument, sorry, uh, you, you can't uh, really win. And with regard to business, uh, it's a complete division. Uh, trade between Russia and Ukraine has fallen by, uh, fell by 80 percent between two, uh, 2012 and 2018, prim uh, 16, primarily because of Russian sanctions, but not only. Of course, Ukraine imposes sanctions also, 
one third of Ukrainian exports to Russia before was armaments. And if you are in a war with a country, it's not very good to export armaments to it. <laughs> so they um, uh, <laughs> gradually stopped uh, do, uh, doing uh, so. And um, uh, Liz, uh, to talked about Yandex uh, before I was uh, just uh, two weeks ago in uh, Kiev, and I asked my driver if he could use uh, uh, Yandex Maps, which is much better than Google Maps, I would say. And uh, he uh, said, no, we can't use it any longer because uh, Yandex is prohibited in, uh, in Ukraine. And the uh, uh, Russian state bank are on their way out of uh, Ukraine, etc. So we are seeing a very quick uh, divestment between Russia and Ukraine, which is essentially that the very previously very substantial Russian investments in Ukraine are being uh, done away with in one way or the other. Well, you want to jump on this too? I think there was a, a bigger kind of conceptual question embedded in it. Okay. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, which is in foreign policy making, is Putin sometimes driven more by politics than by business, right? I think the answer is clearly yes. Um, I think many of the most important foreign policy decisions we've seen in the last four years, from the annexation of Crimea to the intervention in Syria to the intervention in the American elections, wasn't about money making. It was about uh, Russia's position in the world as a great power and asserting itself against the West, uh, which it, which Putin feels has treated it unfairly for you know a long time, and he's determined to reclaim the status that he thinks it deserves. I don't see that those decisions were principally driven by money. I think they were driven by his foreign policy mm. vision for Russia. And That's they, my view. And they may have cost Russia money. Yeah. Yeah, the econo economic success was was sacrificed. Was li mm -hmm. and, and people's uh, goodwill were sacrificed to uh, annexation of Crimea. I mean, people physically lost, it. like, uh, currency dropped by 100%, actually. Okay, I think we have several questions in only five minutes. I'll take three. Uh, we have a question here. And then there's one in the back and one over here. Please, right, this gentleman right here. He had his. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, right, please. Really quick. So first off, thank you for the panel. Very informative. Uh, my name is Benjamin Rappaport. I represent the Roosevelt Group. And my question is, in response to the Russian aggression that we've been seeing over the past few years, if the United States and the West were to pursue a po an aggressive policy of containment on diplomatic, economic, and military fronts, could that possibly cause enough discord within the Russian state apparatus to cause it to collapse? Okay, thank you. One in the far back, and then we'll take one over here, in the far corner here. Uh, thank you again. Um, I'm Tim Modell. I'm a doctoral candidate in political science at Indiana University and a visiting scholar right now at Kennan. Um, so my question is, I'd like to, well, I'd actually like to push back a little on the idea of the, this kind of optimism about the effects of, sh of the sanctions. So we have yet to see any kind of serious defections from the regime, which would suggest that the cost of leaving the system remain higher than any kind of frozen assets that um, seize properties, restricted travel that the, the West can impose on these economic elites in Russia and political elites. Okay, so thank you. Yeah. Okay, actually, we'll take the both the gentlemen over here. We'll do four. Please, quickly. Thank you. Um, my name is Dimitri Sikouris. I'm a former ambassador. Um, working for a U.S. law firm since my retirement six years ago. I don't have a question. I just wanted to uh, take a look, a humoristic look at the uh, phenomenon of corruption and share with you an editorial I read years ago in a country where I was serving as ambassador, a country renowned for corruption. 60 seconds. But people were very, uh, uh, you know, humoristic about it. The editorial was like this. Our country in the international competition of corruption uh, came third, but our government took immediate action, bribed the agency, and we were taking the first position. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. And last, last comment before we turn to the panel, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Robert Drake. I'm from Oregon. Sorry to bring my weather with me here. Um, it's hard not to draw some parallels between Trump's style of doing business and Putin's, and they seem to be closely um, aligned in some ways in the way they handle uh, business and capital. And 
I think if one looks at Trump's presidency, if you look at it in terms of oligarchy, it may, is a much more accurate predictor of the kinds of things that he does with his power. Um, what we've also managed to create here in America that kind of goes undiscussed is we have that same kind of power in our ownership. Uh, the power of ownership has taken an accelerated share of the wealth in our culture. And we don't actually need a, a kleptocracy. We can do most of these extractions with a totally homogenous and, and legal extractions that people really don't tend to mention these kinds of discussions. Um, Ukraine is one of uh, Ukraine is one of the few places that has posed a real challenge to oligarchic power. As a, in, in this particular case, Putin's. I'm wondering if you have any speculation on what the civilized approach to Americans' oligarchic power is. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Open. The first question was relating to containment. Would that lead to uh, changes in Russia? Anyone want to comment on that? Sure, I can go ahead. Um, I mean, Benjamin, you put the question more dramatically, could it eventually lead to a collapse of the system? I think the short answer to that is no. If we look back at the original containment article, it was devised as a long-term strategy for the gradual mellowing of the Soviet regime, right, which took 45 years after the article was published. I, I don't think containment is a strategy that necessarily would yield instant benefits. Um, it may be a piece of U.S. strategy towards Russia. I think there's got to be more to it than that. I think there has to be engagement on certain issues. I think there has to be, um, you know, reassurance on certain issues. So I think it, we need a more complex strategy now than simply containment. Uh, I wanted to come also to Tim O'Dell's questions about the effects of sanctions. Uh, there's an interesting debate about whether the sanctions are actually doing Putin's work <laughs> for him and bringing back the money to Russia that he'd been trying to bring back before through his nationalization of the elite campaign and not actually succeeding. But now when things happen, like what happened with Rousseau, maybe it actually helps him bring the money back where he's more able to control it. On the other hand, some people think, and I, I gather this is part of the strategy behind the sanctions regime, which we haven't seen yet, is that if the money can't find its way abroad so easily, then the pressure from powerful wealthy people inside the system will grow for some kind of internal change in Russian foreign policy. I guess that's the theory. We've seen no evidence of that yet. Um, but I would say it's still an open question. I mean, Maria Snagova had a recent piece out. It came out a week or two ago, sort of looking at some of the pros and cons. And she thinks there actually are some splits occurring because of sanctions effects. But well. Yeah, go ahead. Let me, let me add on this, yeah. uh, because uh, I observe uh, the dominance, the increasing dominance of state capitalism mm -hmm. uh, versus, uh, you know, this exploding machine inside, mm -hmm. uh, inside uh, the country. So this is a situation when a bigger shark <laughs> eats a smaller shark <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> successfully. Uh, and uh, we'll see. Mm -hmm. We don't know yet, but it sounds different. Andrews? Yeah, I would like to emphasize that the, w the Russian system, as we are seeing now, looks petrified. I, I, the growth that is expected is one and a half percent a year. The macroeconomic stability looks very solid. But I think uh, this is what Lisa mentioned here, that uh, uh, worse shocks are eating the good businessmen all the time now. This uh, or what. Uh, uh, Louise talked about the corporate reading. Uh, each time, uh, when we discuss, about 200,000 Russian businessmen are sitting in pre-trial detention because some, Silaviki or the other, are trying to steal their enterprises. Most of them get out for a, a minor uh, bribe that is extorted from them, but uh, many lose their their enterprises. This is not a healthy environment. This is not one where you can develop. And with regard to the sanctions, the sanctions have, uh, they do cut off Russia in so many different ways, in particular with finance. It's been touched upon here a couple of times. Russia's foreign direct investment has been one to two percent a year for, uh, since uh, the war in Ukraine uh, started. Ukraine has not done better. It's the same effect in both countries. But um, this really keeps money out, and we don't see any capital inflow of uh, other kind. So uh, what is happening is that Russian businessmen 
quietly have to decide, do I want to stay when I take home my money? As for example, Alexei Mardashov of uh, Severstal sold his factories in the US and took it home. Uh, and, uh, but most of the big businessmen quietly leave the country, buy a suitable uh, citizenship in Cyprus or uh, or Malta or uh, some, uh, somewhere else, uh, they don't make any noise. Uh, they, they just disappear from the country with the money and uh, they have uh, mostly sold the companies either to the state or to uh, Putin's uh, uh, cronies. This is not uh, a positive development. I uh, li lived as a Swedish diplomat in Moscow 84 to 87 and I had very much the same feeling as in 84 when I arrived. Uh, now in Moscow that everything is petrified, uh, nothing can change and now Putin has just come mm. in for six ye uh, more years and he does <coughs> not even make any pretense that he wants to do any reform apart from the pension reform which he, of course he is not responsible for but we saw from Medvedev. It's just interesting in our discu uh, interesting discussion today is that Several of you have talked about the structure of so post-Soviet society and how it resembles pre-revolutionary society. And that gets us back to this question over here on economic differentiation. And this extreme uh, differentiation between the poor pensioners whose lives are, are threatened at the moment because many of them can't work till 65 and the extreme wealth is eventually a source of political instability. It happened in the 19th century and it'll happen again. When? I can't tell you, but this is not a path forward for economic growth and social stability. I was hearing the same analysis from a top American economic analyst a few weeks ago, that the increasing economic uh, differentiation that will result from our tax cuts and others is also not a prescription for long-term growth and stability in our society. So I think there are things to be thinking about of patterns of, I shouldn't say convergence, but of similarities in between our our two societies and where they're most vulnerable. Thank you. All right, I'd like to thank our panel for a wonderful discussion. Thank you all for coming this afternoon. <laughs>